Well, ladies and gentlemen, our first look at Amazon's Lord of the Rings, the Ri the Rings of Power. I was going to say the Rise of the Rings, because it says Rises there. Um, let's take a look at this. This is a Vanity Fair. They've got loads of images and stuff. Um, yeah, so confirmed Morford Clark is playing Galadriel. You can see that just there, uh, the corner there. Um, but let's dive into it, right? This is either going to be make or break, I think, for a lot of people. Because Lord of the Rings is like it's an untouchable thing, isn't it? You know, with respect to them being so expertly done uh, the first time round, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one to follow. Um, and note how they framed all of this. Uh, I think that's important. So let's take a look. Uh, one rule, uh, one to rule them all. The first look at a billion-dollar saga. Yeah, they've spent a lot of money on this. Uh, Galadriel's world is a raging sea. Far from the wise, ethereal elven queen that Kate Blanchett brought to Peter Jackson's acclaimed films, the Galadriel played by Morford Clark in Amazon's upcoming series, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Tolkien would hate that, the the overuse of the uh, and the rings too much. Uh, is thousands of years younger, as angry and brash as she is clever and certain that evil is looming closer than anyone realises. By episode two, her warnings set her adrift, literally and figuratively, until she's struggling for survival on a raft in the storm-swept, sundering seas, alongside a mortal castaway named Halbrand, uh, who is a new character introduced in the show. Galadriel is fighting for the future. Halbrand is running from the past. Their entwined destinies are just two of the stories woven together for a TV series that, if it works, could become a global phenomenon. Uh, if it falls short, it could become a cautionary tale uh, for anyone who, to quote J.R.R. Tolkien, delves too greedily and too deep. It's quite funny, actually. But anyway, uh, Amazon's show, which debuts on Prime Video on September 2nd, I didn't realise it was so soon, but okay, uh, is based not on a Tolkien novel per se, but on the vast backstory he laid out in the appendices to the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Five seasons will likely cost the studio over $1 billion, uh, and that kind of budget might decimate most of the studios, but Tolkien, like space travel, is a personal obsession for Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, who's among the richest people in the world. This is a big-ticket business venture that would allow him to create the most expensive, elaborate TV series ever made. Um, while Jackson is not connected to the project, his movies, as well as their spiritual successors, Game of Thrones, proved that there's a massive audience for immersive fantasy. Of course, many have tried to capture that same audience, and few... Um, yeah, a few have survived or thrived. Yeah, they don't really do so well. I mean, let's, so let's take a look at this as an image, right? Like, I like Morford Clark. I think she's actually a really good act, uh, actor. Um, she was very, very good in uh, St. Maud. Uh, very, very good. She, she looks fine, I guess. Uh, sure. Um, the Just from a technical perspective, like, this is a still, right? But this is a pretty clean... It's, it's a pretty paint by numbers lens that they're using you know front and center high focus everything else out of focus like you know when you're on these kind of projects use the unique cine lenses which offer a difference you know different perspective like maybe a blurring around the edges as opposed to just everything else blurred like it, it it's a it look my point is is it looks like you'd expect it to look doesn't it and that's not necessarily good right let's agree with that anyway uh, because of Bezos' immense wealth, the Rings of Power is actually less of a financial risk than it is uh, a re uh, reputational one. Uh, Amazon needs to definitively make the case that it can produce giant prestige shows. And with this series, it's courting the additional dangers of amending and elaborating uh, on the canon of the beloved story. Storyteller. Uh, the showrunners Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne are agonizingly aware of the pressure. This series will juggle 22 stars and multiple storylines. Mm, interesting, multiple storylines. I thought we were sort of having one or two, but okay. Um, interesting. From deep within the dwarf mines of the Misty Mountains to the high politics of the elven kingdom of Lindon and the humans' powerful Atlantis-like island Numenor, all this will center eventually around the incident that gives the trilogy its name, the Forging of the Rings. Uh, says McKay, rings for the elves, rings for dwarves, rings for men, and then the one ring Sauron used to deceive them all. It's the story of the creation of all those powers, 
uh, where they came from and what they did to each of those races. The driving question behind the production, he adds, was this, can we come up with the novel Tolkien never wrote and to do it as the mega event series that could only happen now? That's a tall claim, isn't it? That that's what you're trying to do, like Jesus. Uh, Galadriel's survival at sea is not just a crucial story point at the start of the series. The showrunners remember it is a pivotal moment on set in New Zealand back in March 2020. Morford was a few days into being Galadriel, which is probably terrifying. Uh, she's in water, there's a lot of visual effects, there's music and light. But despite the momentous scene in front of them, the show's crew were glued to their phones. Within 45 minutes, word spread that in nearby Australia, Tom Hanks had contracted COVID. The NBA had cancelled its season and the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. We are just going, oh my God, what are we going to do? We're going to have to shut everything down. Uh, the panic uh, metastasized. Um, setting off other anxieties, big and small. It was terrifying. Blah, blah, blah. My COVID. Uh, can you imagine going back to such a beloved world and facing the high bar? Um, so, uh, but one by one, the crew put down their phones. Everyone was crowding around the monitor and within this close-up where Gladwell's face falls the screen. And she cries, uh, and she cries, and she decides after f after fight. Says McKay. As soon as the scene ended, the soundstage erupted in cheers. It's a perfect example of how Tolkien and Middle Earth have a way of finding you, even in the darkest and most uncertain moments. Which I, I'm guessing, it's like that is the scene, right? She is a good actor. Like no matter what anyone says about her being Galadriel, like to remove that from this discussion, she's a good actor because she is. Um, here's some shots of people fine i mean i could you know i could shrink it down but you're just gonna get more adverts so i don't really want to do that um you know sure i guess like fine dwarf looks fine i don't know who this individual in the middle is supposed to be uh a dwarven princess sorry the dwarven princess disa okay at casa doom's entrance interesting uh who's this the Sylvan Elf, Aronde. Uh, okay, that's a character who's been created for the series. I mean, like, in, like you have to talk about. Um, I mean, you have to. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know whether Tolkien would. Yeah. It's really important to note that the Lord of the Rings was based on England, right? The Shires, like, it is based on England. Um, a lot of this stuff wouldn't fly in Tolkien's mind i would imagine so anyway uh, this part of the story is most famous uh as ruins after the success of 1937 children's story the hobbit uh, tolkien turned his attention back to a volume of middle earth history which his publisher rejected uh, which is the silmarillion so uh, as the second world war blah blah, blah so just a bit about backstory but it, that's what it's about so in the story an unlikely fellowship ventures into mordor to destroy Sh Sauron's ring um so that's about the one we know obviously um, but like big sound stages, the thing is like all of this looks what like li this looks like grand, you know, good. But it should be with the money that they're spending on it. And this is the raft that they're talking about. Uh, this image here, fine. Okay, yeah, fine. This is a bit of a better uh, lens from a technical perspective. Like you look at how uh, bokered out everything else is, and it sort of peters off towards the edge of the scenes, and then it brings it into focus midway. Um, that's, that's not bad. That's a little bit of a different lens. Quite nice. Um, and scroll down a little bit more. You know, there's a little bit more here. This looks fine. Um, it's a little bit too clean. But this... Mm, where is this supposed to be? In the village of Tahared. Yeah, maybe it's supposed to be that kind of clean then. This is an interesting one. Uh, Elrond and... Galadriel are reunited in the majestic elven kingdom of Linden. This looks quite nice. A little bit too setty, painty at the back. Um, I'm definitely being like nitpicky, FYI. Uh, but you have to be like, this is it just is what it is, right? It's, we have to nitpick it a little bit. I mean, like this, for instance, right? This is a silly mistake. That's too tight. Like she's got a roll of skin coming out. Like I know some people are going, oh, you've been a fucking nitpick. But all you had to do was just bend it a little bit more, and then she wouldn't have had a roll of skin. It's just those silly little things that make you go, Ugh, did, is, there, is there a lot behind this, you know? Do you know what I mean? Um, this is interesting. 
Uh, J.A. Biona points the way for two nomadic hunters wandering the fields of Middle Earth. I mean, how the. What? Not very practical, is it? Um, and and as well, like again, we have to address it. All of the the, the level of diversity in this, right? Um, you know, you're looking at it outside of the lens that Tolkien looked at it through, right? Because you're looking at it from the perspective of you know the sort of old old English countryside and stuff, and they're not actually that diverse. They're just not. Um, I know loads of people would be like, "Oh, that's racist." And that's not. They just, they just they just aren't that diverse. And, and Tolkien writing it. From that perspective, like Dorset was part of it, Oxford was part of it. Um, you you got to think to yourself, like, would he would he approve? I mean, I'm sure, like by today's lens, yeah, probably. Um, but when it's such a stark change, and this is the other thing to address, and again, you know, it doesn't come down to like personal opinion or anything like that. But you know, you got to pause it here a little bit, right? What are people going to think of this when they're comparing it to Peter Jackson's? Right, Peter Jackson's was very specific. Um, and it, and it was whitewashed, if you want to say it right. Like it wasn't whitewashed; just every character was white for the most part. Um, and that it, that's because they just are in the books, right? Because of the races and stuff in the books and, and what they are. So if that's the pinnacle, that's the yardstick for all other things to be measured by. How will people view this with such a blatant divergence from that? Now. I'm not saying that they're going to judge it negatively, but I think it's an interesting thing to point out because I think people will potentially be a bit like, oh, what's going on there then? I don't know. I, I just I just think so. Um, but anyway, there you go. There's our first look and sort of first, you know, in, in, proper look at it. What do you guys think? Let me know down below. Uh, love to hear your thoughts. Cheers, guys. Take care.